So welcome to all for attending the Virginia Ryan White 2022 Quality Management Summit. Please let me recognize the people who made this conference happen. Big thanks to Virginia Department of Health, the Quality Management Advisory Committee members, the Virginia Quality of Care Consumer Advisory Committee, and including all Ryan White part, part A, B, C, D, and F members. Thanks to the esteemed members of the Quality Management Summit Planning Committee. Special thanks to the co-organizers, organizer, the Virginia Commonwealth University Aid Education Training Center and uh, VCU HIV Aid Resources and Consultation Center staff members and its contractors, CVENT, and Kuro, you made it happen again. As you are all aware, this Virginia Quality Management Summit 2022 is more than unique. It's our second virtual quality management summit, and we'd like to apologize to all participants that will experience challenges due to the internet or other related issues. The two-day summit will demonstrate the unique nature of the Virginia Quality Management Summit, which is the interaction between our providers and our community partners we serve. We will share knowledge, best practices, and update ourselves with seven plenary sessions, six breakout session, and one satellite exhibit session. In doing so, I believe we have met all our objectives for the Quality Management Summit. Several outstanding presenters recognized as experts in the field will teach you how to incorporate the latest best practices and the tool into your practices. We'll discuss challenges, challenging topic and give you many opportunities to ask questions and interact with each other through live moderated question and answer session and the integrated question and session chat tools. There have been great achievements by our clinical quality management program since our last quality management summit. To the challenge posed by the COVID pandemic, we have translated the knowledge and shared experiences into actions to bring the epidemic to a halt in our four health regions. 100% of our sub-recipients have their quality management plan developed and implemented, and also working on the statewide selected quality improvement project targeting viral loss suppression for those who are not viral loss suppressed. We initiated a rapid study project, started with six sites, and we have grown the project to 15 sites in year two of the pilot program. The VECEC, the Virginia Consumer Advisory Committee, led monthly peer-led psychosocial training and education moment statewide during the whole last year. Two VACEC members are now full membership of the EDAP Advisory Committee. VACEC leaders are members of the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services, Medicaid Member Advisory Committee. And all the QMAC and VECEC members have led several presentations statewide and at national level. This Quality Management Summit is one important step on the way we support our health system. It shows 
our own resilience to come together despite the COVID-19 pandemic and challenges to first overcome our fears. I would conclude by inviting all stakeholders, principally the sub-recipients, the Quality Management Advisory Committee, our Consumer Advisory Committee, please, when sending out any HIV aid, care and prevention, measure information to join the integrate COVID-19 prevention tool to that message. My last word of appreciation go to the Virginia Department of Health, the Division of Disease Prevention and HIV Care Services leadership for their consistent support in answering a successful Virginia Quality Management Program, including this Quality Management Summit. I thank all of you and wish you healthy and prosperous years 2022. Good morning, everyone. I'm Dwight Rackley, Director of HIV Education at the VCU HIV Education Program and Regional Coordinator for the Mid-Atlantic AIDS Education Training Center and the Virginia HIV AIDS Resource and Consultation Center. On behalf of the Virginia Department of Health and VCU, I am pleased to welcome you all, especially our new attendees, to our annual Ryan White Quality Management Summit. And to all of our new non-Ryan White attendees, welcome to the HIV Care Services family. The summit is designed to help build capacity among Ryan White providers and consumers, as well to conduct quality improvement activities and to enlarge the pool of quality improvement trainings across the Commonwealth of Virginia. But before I get started, I would like to express my sincere appreciation to everyone who worked so hard and helped make this virtual event come together to become a great success. Thank you so much to my VCU team and our partners with CVET and VDH. We couldn't have done this without you. This year's Quality Management Summit theme is Changing Your Lens to Enhance Quality. This is our second virtual Quality Management Summit. This year, we have over 120 registrants and 34 agencies. And we're super excited to have all of you join us this year from across the state. As you can see from the upcoming slides, here are the agencies represented from across the state. First is the Northern Region. Next, we have the Northwest Region. Next, we have the Southwest Region. Next, we have the Central Region. And last but not least, the Eastern Region. We all know that the last two years have been extremely challenging to healthcare workers, their families, and our patients. 2022 is not what we thought it was going to be. We had all hoped that we would be past the COVID pandemic by now. But like everything else, things change. But our mutual passion to help our patients, even in a raging pandemic, shows our true dedication and commitment. And it helps us all to unite and help one another to achieve the highest quality of care for our patients. This is why we are so grateful to have you join us here for another excellent virtual quality management summit. During the next couple of days, you will be learning more about quality management through our planned activities and special events where you'll be able to join in breakout sessions and hopefully network with others through the state agency websites, instant networking feature and discussion groups. So again, a very warm welcome to each and every one of you and we hope you enjoy the Quality Management Summit. Thank you again very much. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll follow this uh, brief welcome, the presentation of Virginia Department of Health updates by three presenters. We have Rick Vamida, who is the lead HIV services coordinator, Jasmine Ford, who is HIV Care Services Clinical Coordinator, and Terry Clark, who is also HIV Care Services and uh, Coordinator. So that said, we're gonna listen to those three and presenting the video update. Thank you so much. My name is Rivka Metter, and for those whom I have not yet met, I am the lead HIV Services Coordinator 
I joined the HIV Care Services Unit in June of 2021, and I am so pleased to join you today to share some updates and reminders from our unit. I am also joined by my colleagues, Terry Clark, HIV Services Coordinator, and Jasmine C. Ford, Clinical Quality Coordinator for the Virginia MAP Program. I will now hand the presentation over to Terry. Hello, everyone. I will begin by giving a virtual introduction to two new faces within the Division of Disease Prevention. First up is Dr. Lindsay Lockwood, who joined our unit in November of 2021 as the new Assistant Director for HIV Care Services. Originally an English major, Dr. Lockwood spent two years in the Czech Republic as an English teacher and conference producer before returning to the U.S. to obtain her master's degree in public health. After graduating with her MPH from Eastern Virginia Medical School, Dr. Lockwood moved to India, practicing public health in a small rural village. Upon return to the U.S., she spent the next seven years as the population health manager for a local health department, during which time she earned her Doctor of Health Science degree from Eastern Virginia Medical School and had two daughters, the most recent born in November. Lindsay is out on leave this week, but I know she looks forward to meeting all of our contractors and community partners in the coming months. Next up, it is my pleasure to virtually introduce Amani Butler. Amani joined DDP in December in the newly created role of trauma-informed care coordinator to help integrate trauma-informed principles into HIV, hepatitis, and STI prevention and care. Amani is a Virginia native and plant mom. She received her bachelor's degree in global and community health from George Mason University and her master's degree in public health from George Washington University. Before this role, she spent several years working as a sexual and mental health educator for youth in New Orleans at the Institute of Women and Ethnic Studies. Amani was also a health equity fellow for the US Department of Health and Human Services Office of Minority Health. Welcome Amani. I would now like to share some reminders of deliverables due in the coming weeks as GY21 draws to a close. To that end, please complete all data entry for GY21 and to provide or provide via CareWare by April the 15th. Submit all invoices, including the reconciliation invoice via the secure folder by April 30th. And complete and submit your annual progress report by also April 30th. We request that you submit it with your final invoice. If you were advised to create a corrective action plan in response to the site visit, that document and all follow-up should be completed by the end of the grant year or per the deadlines that your services coordinator has communicated. Finally, please take note of the remaining meetings for the grant year. The Rapid Start Learning Collaborative will take place on February the 23rd and March the 18th. The quarterly contractors meeting will take place on March the 2nd. The virtual case management summit will take place on March the 3rd and March the 4th. Tanya Paselli will share more about those meetings tomorrow. I now turn the presentation back over to Rivka. Thanks, Terry. I would like to build off Terry's closeout reminders with a quick spotlight on Grant Year 21 site visits. Most subrecipients and contractors have had their required Grant Year site visit at this point. All of those visits were virtual for the second year in a row. Virtual visits present challenges, particularly for agencies who still use paper records, as sharing either required scanning a large volume of documents for secure transmission, or in some cases, holding charts up to a webcam and pointing to the required information. Although we do hope travel will be safe and allowable in grant year 22, we will take the lessons we learned about virtual site visits including VDH's own comprehensive site visit with the Health Resources and Services Administration this past January to enhance any future, future virtual visits and in-person visits as well. In addition to the challenges of virtual visits, we also implemented a new site visit tool with a comprehensive chart review in order to further compliance with Ryan White Part B legislative and programmatic requirements. Based on this new tool, Many more agencies than in previous years had findings that required a corrective action plan. 
However, most of these findings were small and easily corrected. Some of the most common findings from our Grant Year 21 site visits were incorrect use of medical case management, lack of access to third party records, missing treatment plans for mental health, and data entry errors. We will continue to work with all agencies to clarify legislative and programmatic requirements to help our contractors have compliant programs. We also wish to thank all of our contractors for their patience and extra effort to accommodate virtual visits and the implementation of the more comprehensive site visit tool and data sample pool. Now, I would like to look ahead to grant year 22 with a specific eye on the contract renewal process, which is now well underway. Many of you already know that grant year 22 represents the first time in many years that the Ryan White Part B program has been budgeted to maximize care without funding to expand service delivery. While this budget reflects successful expenditures of base grant funds and pharmaceutical rebates in the grant year, for which they are designated and or earned as required by HRSA, it also means we will have the lowest amount of carryover that we have had in seven years. Additionally, while rebates remain an essential part of our successful strategy to increase Ryan White Part B services, they are also extraordinarily hard to predict. Finally, CARES Act funds are on track for full expenditure by March 31st, and as a result, the Virginia Ryan White Part B program is not requesting any CARES Act funds to be carried over into grant year 22. We thank you for working hard to prepare for, respond to, and prevent COVID-19 for our vulnerable population. Please continue to work with your services coordinator if you have any questions about your grant year 22 funding amount. In order to ensure that your contract is fully executed by March 31st, 2022, please keep the following in mind. Ensure that you use the Grant Year 22 budget workbook template available on the VDH website. We are now incorporating the Virginia Integrated HIV Services Plan into agency level work plans to ensure that we all are working toward the same goals using consistent data driven strategies. In order to facilitate this transition, we have created a template that your services coordinator or contract administrator will help you to complete. We will also provide additional technical assistance in advance of grant year 23 renewals in order to integrate the plan into your own work plan. Closely monitor your email and make note of deliverable deadlines. Remember that you cannot retroactively bill for services rendered after April 1st, 2022, if you do not have a contract in place. And finally, work with and educate your internal procurement personnel to help expedite execution on your end. We thank you in advance for your patience as we work through the contract renewal process and look forward to continuing our partnership in grant year 22. I will now hand the presentation over to Jasmine Ford for updates from the Virginia MAP program. Hello and welcome to the Clinical Quality Management Summit. I'm Jasmine Christine Ford, and I'll be delivering the Virginia Medication Assistance Program update. Provide phase two go live occur January 26, 2022. Contracted agencies should have received their user ID slash password via email to access the system received by January 31st, 2022. Contracted agencies who did not receive their user ID slash password should reach out to the program at vaprovide at vdh.virginia.gov. Please allow two to three business days for a response. Agencies who do not have access to provide can still enter their assessments through the web portal, vacare.providecm.net. Start utilizing the provide system for all Ryan White Part B assessment. Additional clarification will be provided when unified eligibility is discussed further on in the summit. 
Virginia MAP will arrange technical assistance sessions for agency provide users that may need additional support. Look for these dates and times to be posted on the website. A scattered schedule of times will be available for your convenience. Website link dedicated specifically to provide listed below. Virginia MAP is receiving a large volume of insurance updates for individuals who did not complete open enrollment with Benelytics. If clients are having difficulties using their Ramsell cards, please reach out to the program. For insured clients, it is quicker and more cost effective to activate the Ramsel card, then requesting temporary direct map access or for the agency to purchase medication by utilizing the HIPSCA service category. The 2022 Virginia MAP quarterly call schedule will be posted to the Virginia MAP website. That concludes the Virginia MAP updates. Thank you and have a spectacular summit. Tamika Gales is a 33-year-old transgender woman that lives in Richmond, Virginia. She has worked side by side with medical professionals for over 10 years. Some things that she enjoys is dancing, singing, and drawing. And now we'll hear from Tamika for her perspective as a transgender woman. Gales, um, I'm a 33-year-old trans woman um, that lives in Richmond, Virginia. Um, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland. I've been here for about about 20 years or so. Um, graduated from Honda Springs High School. Um, yeah, just pretty much my intro um, hobbies. I'm, I'm a dancer. I sing, I love to draw, I love art. Um, yeah, so I'll talk about my care treatment, I guess, or how I feel about care here. Uh, being a transgender woman, um, I feel like care is not taken as serious as um, like a heterosexual or a cisgendered man or a cisgender woman um, care be. I feel like um, we go through so much as far as just trying to get treatment started. Um, because I know my story is I've been HIV positive for um, 11 years. Um, I had no support whatsoever. Um, no, no, really no family, no, no doctors. I didn't know who to go to. It was no resources for me. Um, so basically I was just living with this disease. I feel like, um, of course I wanna be treated like a regular person, but I know being a black trans woman is um, really kind of, it's difficult here. Um, we don't, I feel like providers, especially dealing with like HIV care, our providers aren't as sensitive as they need to be to our needs. And they don't, I feel like they don't understand, um, they don't understand our own treatment. It's, it's one thing, it's one thing about like the HIV treatment, but it's a whole nother thing where I have to take hormones, I have to get surgeries, I have to, you know, and on top of treatment so I feel like that's like it's a lot with very little help so that will cause these people to like get I know I can speak on my behalf it causes me I've been in and out of treatment um care before um I've been without care for for years because of 
um, I feel like the providers with me are very biased. They were sensitive to my needs and to, to my wants. Um, just because I'm not a medical provider, I still, like, I kind of live like this every day. So I kind of know what works best for me. Um, and it's like the, um, you have to, with the providers, you have to like, have jobs and I mean it's not like a regular a cisgender woman or a cisgender man. And we can go out and get jobs and it's no it's not a lot of resources for us. And we would think that the medical field or somebody of that statue will have way more resources that we can use and utilize. But it's um here it's like we are pretty much by ourselves or we are pretty much in this as a as a unit of trans people, especially being trans of color, like it's really, really hard. Um, yeah, it's really hard. Like I said, I've been dealing with this for 11 years. So I've been through the ringers. Um, of course, I expect to, I expect to be treated just like everybody else. Like I just want to live life, um, be a woman and, you know, um, be healthy. And it's been times, like I said, it's been times where I've been out of care because of I felt like I wasn't being treated fair. So a person like me, where we think, I would think like, well, I'd rather just die than to be mistreated than to be, you know, um, looked upon different to be, you know, I remember I was in the hospital, I was in the doctor for a checkup one time and my appointment was like at 11 o'clock a.m. I didn't get seen until 5 o'clock after everybody else. And I felt like my provider and the people, the staff, I felt like it's because I was trans. I was the only trans person and that really discouraged me from getting treatment. So I've went years without any help. With I've been sick, been in hospitals and, you know, but I really can't put that on providers. I feel like they don't have the education to deal with trans women that they need to take care of us. So I feel like everybody, um, I feel like it's just a knowledge thing. Everybody just need to get educated on so many levels about each other. So it can work, right? You're my provider, I'm your client or consumer and you know, like it can, it can gel well together if we understood each other. Like I've, I've got friends that have been um, going through this for years, right? It, it's just not started with me. It's, it's, I have friends, the LGBTQ community that gets treated the same way. And I try to give the providers the benefit of the doubt as far as why, as far as they don't know a lot about trans people to even deal with us. So like you can be, it's, this goes as far as like pronouns and you know, like that's, that's, that's a big thing. Even if I'm, my, my name is changing now or if, if a trans person was there, I feel like, you know, you address them as, as they want to be addressed then. you know, um, just the normal common, common courtesy, I guess you could say, you should say, but um, yeah, I, it, it, I've had good experiences as well, but my, my big thing is, my main thing is, I just want, it's, it's more of an equality thing. I see trans men, transgender men and transgender women be treated totally different, totally different. Um, so I got into, um, I feel out of care and the reason why is because I felt like the providers wasn't, um, for me being trans and black, I felt like they wasn't catering to my needs. Um, they wasn't being sensitive. I'm not saying that they're bad, but I feel like it's just a lack of knowledge to deal with, um, transgender women, um, in the healthcare system. Um, yeah, it's not enough knowledge. And I was in a dark place, um, but I felt out of care. Um, I just 
didn't feel my living or I didn't feel like it was worth it. And it was just so, so many odds against me. And I, I gave up. But like I said, I was um, at Minority Health Consortium. Um, it's where pretty much I got my life back, actually. Um, really good place. They um, got me into care with providers. I started getting into um, trans meetings and groups. And um, it picked my spirits up, made me feel good about myself, um, made, made me have a reason to live and to want to get back into care. And, take care of myself and you know I had to realize um these people not I feel like they not 100 percent for me but I just when I had to make the um, decision to pretty much live for myself and take initiative and what I want and what I believe in and so I got back into care um I got back into care through minority health. Um, like I said, I was going through to trans groups, trans meeting, the LGBT thing. Like they really have like really good programs, really good support groups. Um, yeah, because when I said I was at the bottom, it was just like, you know, a lot of transgender women, we can't get jobs. We can't, you know, have these houses and, you know, just, regular things that we want we just want to live life as well but it just makes it so much harder what we have to deal with our health especially being in this situation um it just was a a, a big weight on your shoulders when you have to be trans and no providers like understand you you know um i have a real good provider now uh, because they're trans as well so they know everything that I go through and they can pretty much, they pretty much sympathize and understand me. But I feel like all healthcare professionals should know how to cater or deal with a person of trans. Um, because it's, it's very discouraging when you feel like you can't even go to a doctor and they can't even tell you what's wrong or what's, you know, give you any type of direction other than it's, it's, it's bigger than just HIV. It's a whole, I have to deal with my mental health, um, you know, on top of meds, on top of being trans or homelessness or have to provide for myself, whether it's side jobs or whatever it is that you do to to make a living you still have to live so like i said minority health consortium they really really gave me my life back um so anybody can go there minority health consortium it's on second and clay richmond virginia um yeah really good place to go to um i'm in i'm currently in treatment now and like I said, I have a new provider in there trans as well. And everything is going very smoothly. Um, I got my friends into treatment. Um, everything is going well with them. Um, I feel like over time, well, from 11 years ago until now, it has gotten a little better on my behalf. But I know I still have friends and other trans people that still having an issue as far as like um, getting medications, not being treated equally or treated the way they want to be treated. And it, it, it causes the issue because if I can't go to my provider to feel safe and to feel, you know, who can I go to? So then I, that's when you stop, like you stop medications and you can get into drugs or the street or you know anything like that and that's not what we want like it's 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 really hard but that's me you have to well myself i had to realize like i have to live for me and i have to make these decisions and i know i want to live i want to be healthy i want to you know just be the girl and it's going good now, I can honestly say. Um, I'm in a good place. I'm back, um, I'm back in health, um, taking care of myself. Um, everything's going good. So, and I just want to thank everybody for um, just 
taking the time to listen to my story. Um, hopefully this inspires somebody. Hopefully um, it gets somebody back into care or hopefully a provider. Uh, it gives you some type of understanding um, how to deal with transgender people or make you want to get knowledge or something, you know. Um, but yeah, thank you for listening um, to my story. Hi everyone, I'm Ashley Yoakum and I serve as the HIV Services Planner with the Virginia Department of Health. Thank you Tamika Giles for, for, for providing your perspective and welcome to our first plenary session. Today's session will be on Medicaid's role in enhancing behavioral health services across Virginia. Today's speakers are Ashley Harrell, who is a Substance Use Disorder Senior Program Advisor for Substance Use Disorder Services in the Behavioral Health Division at the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services, and Laura Reed, who is, the, who is also a Behavioral Health Senior Program Advisor in the Behavioral Health Division at the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services. For more information on each speaker, you can view their bios on the speaker page. On the right side of your screen, you can see a Q&A icon when you click on that icon, a box will open where you will be able to submit questions during the presentation. Please submit questions at any time, and we will be answering some of them at the end of the presentation. In case we do not get to answer all questions today, please share your name by unchecking the Ask Anonymously box so that we will be able to follow up. And now I'll hand it over to Ashley and Laura. Thank you. Hi, I'm Ashley Harrell with the Virginia Department of Medical Assistance Services, um, and I'm here today with my colleague, Laura Reed. Uh, we are in our Behavioral Health Division at the Medicaid Agency, and we will talk to you today about Medicaid's role in enhancing the behavioral health services uh, in Virginia. So Virginia Medicaid is the largest payer of uh, health insurance uh, both uh, for the Commonwealth as well as Medicaid is the largest source of health insurance nationally. Medicaid is also the largest payer for behavioral health services. Medicaid is state-based and eligibility is based on an individual's income. Medicare is operated by the federal government and is mostly age-based and does not call, cover all the services that Medicaid covers. Virginia Medicaid serves over 1.9 million individuals the majority being children and non-disabled adults. Medicaid expansion, which was implemented in January of 2019, covers the full array of services under the medical, Medicaid benefit, including behavioral health and substance use disorder treatment services. As of January 15th of 2022, there are just over 657,000 adults enrolled in Medicaid through expansion. Of these, almost 60,000 members have accessed a substance use disorder benefit, which in, for Medicaid is called the Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services Benefit, or ARTS. So Medicaid essentially has two delivery systems to access and utilize the Medicaid benefit. One is called fee-for-service, as you see here on the left, and sometimes referred to as straight Medicaid. And then also we have our managed care benefit, which in Virginia, we have two benefits. Uh, one is medallion four and the other is CCC plus. So medallion and uh, CCC plus serve the majority of Medicaid benefits or beneficiaries uh, for Virginia Medicaid. Today, close to 287,000 members are served by our Commonwealth coordinated plus benefit, and just over 1.5 million members are served through our medallion benefit. In general, medallion serves infants, children, adolescents, pregnant women, parents, caretaker adults, and adults who are newly eligible under the Medicaid expansion benefit. While CCC Plus serves older adults, children and adults with disabilities, medically complex, newly eligible adults, and individuals who are in Medicare and Medicaid. 
This slide shows you the full array of services that fall under Medicaid benefit. This includes both behavioral health services that Laura will discuss, as well as the addiction and recovery treatment services benefit, which I'll share with you today. There are six managed care plans for Virginia Medicaid that serve both the CC plus population and medallion members. Whether individuals are enrolled in medallion or CC plus, they will be able to choose from one of these six health plans. So effective July 1st of 2022, the Department of Medical Assistance Services will be implementing a new managed care delivery system. This is called Project Cardinal. Project Cardinal unifies the medallion and the CC plus programs under a single managed care contract. The goal of Project Cardinal is to promote an efficient, well-coordinated system of care for members, to streamline the administrative processes for Medicaid providers and our managed care organizations, and to build a strong and equitable program foundation on which to build future program innovations and improvements. The Department of Medical Assistance Services determined that unifying these two managed care programs under a single managed care contract and delivery system would result with a more efficient and well-coordinated system of care for members. It would add value to our providers and would allow DMAS enhanced capacity to focus on monitoring, oversight, and value. This also eliminates the need for members to have to transition between two managed care programs, which can be disruptive at times, and to maintain the members' managed care coverage, which improves continuity of care and help to drive the right care at the right time. This also avoids confusion for members uh, with family members in both programs and drives equity into a fully integrated, well-coordinated system of care. The first major step is a multi-phase initiative. DMS will consolidate the programs into a single contract effective July 1st. Aligning these programs cover five focus areas. One is in addition to contract consolidation, we also have to pursue uh, changing regulations um, and repealing the current regulations for Medallion and CC+. Another component uh, is merging the contracts. The Cardinal Care Managed Care Contract will align model of care to promote timely, high quality care based on members' needs and risks, including the members as the members' needs evolve. We will also ensure sufficient levers are in the contract for oversight and monitoring. We will make minimal changes for systems during phase one, uh, but phase two will include a more robust system changes. And then finally, as we launch these phases, Department of Medical Assistance Services will continue to keep stakeholders informed. The majority of individuals, um, as I discussed earlier, that are enrolled in Virginia Medicaid are gonna be in our managed care benefits. Managed care has been in place for Virginia Medicaid for over 25 years. And with the implementation of ARTS and Project Bravo, we're standardizing the contract language, rates, and program requirements across all of the managed care organizations. So now I will transition and share with you some information on our ARTS benefit, um, as well as some outcomes from our four-year evaluation. So national data shows that fewer than 13% of nearly 21 million plus people who have a substance use disorder get treatment services. To address the lack of access and care and improve outcomes for people with substance use disorders, there needs to be a comprehensive, adequately financed system and where everybody with a substance use disorder, regardless of their economic circumstances, can readily access this evidence-based care. So Medicaid has a significant role in meeting this need. You can see here, prior to the Medicaid benefits uh, being implemented uh, in April of 2017, Virginia, similar to other states in the nation, were experiencing a surge in overdose fatalities due to the opioid epidemic. 
The Virginia governor and the legislature knew that Medicaid needed to change to be able to address this trajectory. These are the critical elements for a successful transformation of the Medicaid benefit. It included political will, stakeholder engagement, a common shared agenda, using data to evaluate outcomes and identify areas in need by standardizing policies to support evidence-based care. So this is the Addiction and Recovery Treatment Services Benefit or ARTS. This is the full continuum of care. Um, and this was significant because Medicaid has a major role in an individual's recovery. Virginia Medicaid is the key component for coverage for eligible adults, especially through Medicaid expansion, which implemented in January of 2019, as well as the implement, implementation of the ARTS benefit in 2017. You can see here that ARTS covers the full continuum of care from the left-hand portion where it's acute hospitalization, residential treatment, partial hospitalization, intensive outpatient, opioid treatment programs, our new office-based opioid treatment model, which I'll share with you uh, in the next slide, and peer recovery supports, which we implemented in, in July of 2017. ARTS has had a significant impact on individuals being identified with substance use disorder. ARTS utilizes the nationally recognized evidence-based criteria for addiction medicine, which is the American Society of Addiction Medicine, or the ACM criteria. The ACM utilizes a standardized multidimensional assessment. It has standardized decision-making roles to determine the right level of care that an individual needs and also standardizes service characteristics, so it helps define what each of these levels of care includes. The Department of Medical Assistance Services uh, contracted with Virginia Commonwealth University, the Department of Health, Behavior and Policy to, to conduct an independent evaluation of the arts benefit. These next slides show you the outcomes of the fourth year post arts implementation. Identification of members with substance use disorders significantly increased with the ARTS benefit, especially with Medicaid expansion. You can see here that prior to the ARTS benefit uh, implemented in 2016, we had just over 48,000 individuals identified with a substance use disorder. As of 2020, we have over 108,000, so 122% increase in individuals that are eligible for Medicaid that were identified with a substance use disorder diagnosis. There were also increases in the number of members accessing treatment. From 2017 to 2020, for individuals with an opiate use disorder, there was an increase of just over 55% to over 74% of individuals engaging in treatment. For individuals with alcohol use disorder, there was an increase of just over 27% in 2017 to 36% in 2020. And for individuals with all substance use disorders, this increased from 36% to 48% in 2020. ARTS has also helped uh, increase overall provider, provider capacity in the Commonwealth. You can see here, uh, this covers from the, the top row from acute care and it, um, inpatient withdrawal management within a hospital setting uh, down to the bottom where we're looking at outpatient providers. But most significantly, I want to point out our new model of care, the preferred office-based opioid treatment provider, which didn't uh, exist uh, in the Medicaid benefit uh, before ARTS was implemented in 2017. And um, as of this, uh, the, the recording of this session, we have a, currently 191 sites. So the preferred office-based opioid treatment benefit requires a co-located buprenorphine waiver practitioner that is able to prescribe buprenorphine products for the treatment of opiate use disorder and a licensed behavioral health clinician. And this model provides more stringent and a higher intensity level of services, including care coordination. This is significant um, because with our preferred OBOT, 
we have had over a 395% increase in access to medications for opiate use disorder from 2016 to 2020. Co-prescribing of opioids for pain medication, as well as benzodiazepines, also declined for members receiving treatment for opioid use disorder through our preferred OBOTs. However, uh, this was uh, something that the CDC just posted on um, this past year, and as of November of 2021, uh, they have reported that nationally we have hit over 100,000 deaths uh, for 2020. It is estimated about 70% of these deaths involved a, a, an opioid. So as we continue to address both the COVID-19 pandemic and the opioid crisis, we must prioritize, prioritize making treatment options more widely available to people with substance use disorders. And in Virginia, unfortunately, things have been bad, but they're getting worse. This is the Virginia Department of Health fatal drug overdose report as of October of 2021. Fentanyl caused or contributed to death in over 72% of all fatal overdoses in 2020. Fatal non-opioid illicit drug overdoses are also on the rise. In 2020, compared to 2019, fatal cocaine overdoses increased 33%, and fatal methamphetamine overdoses increased 94%. The preliminary total of all fatal overdoses for all substances in 2020 compared to 2019 increased by over 41%. This is a record setting statistic. So why do we continue to see a significant uptick in overdose deaths despite better access to providers than ever before. So Medicaid is looking at several different um, strategies to address this epidemic. Uh, we're looking at uh, increasing high quality evidence-based care, that's increasing medications for opioid use disorder, implementing the ASAM criteria, leveraging peer recovery support services, we're also focusing on priority populations and their families, and this includes parenting and pregnant individuals, as well as individuals that are justice involved. We're focusing on transitions of care, and this is individuals that are transitioning from an acute care or an emergency department stay, as well as individuals transitioning from institutional stays, including local and regional jails, as well as prisons. And then also looking at how we're utilizing data, uh, looking at areas that um, we may need to focus our efforts, as well as looking at a strengths-based perspective. Or I'll call it, uh, we call it bright spots um, that I'll share with you in the next few slides. So looking at areas that have good outcomes and maybe how we can replicate those in other, other communities. So looking at our high quality evidence-based care, as I mentioned, our preferred OBOT model, um, we are expanding this. Um, so this spring of 2022, we are allowing reimbursement for our preferred OBOTs to serve individuals with other primary substance use disorders. We've also expanded our preferred OBOT to be able to deliver services via a mobile unit. And this is in addition to being able to leverage the telemedicine flexibilities to expand services. And then also fostering a collaboration with our health systems to implement and expand our emergency department bridge clinics. And that's where an individual, if they present to the emergency department with a non-fatal overdose, that they're initiated uh, for individuals with an opiate use disorder, they're initiated on buprenorphine for the treatment of uh, opiate use disorder, and then a warm handoff to a community-based provider, including our preferred OBOTs. We're also expanding our access to peer recovery support services. Um, part of this is removing some administrative burdens, but also streamlining the, and standardizing the registration process for our managed care organization. We also work closely with our Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services um, Office of Licensing, which incorporated the ASAM criteria into their licensing process as of July of 2021. 
Virginia was one of 15 states that were awarded a grant through the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services to increase substance use disorder provider capacity. And this is through our, our Support Act grant. Um, since March of 2020, we have conducted over 100 free substance use disorder provider webinars and trainings, reaching over 9,000 attendees. This also included three buprenorphine waiver trainings for, for prescribers. Through the Support Act, we also conducted surveys uh, to help understand uh, the experiences of ARTS members, uh, but also as well as our provider community. And then through the Support Act, conducting a statewide needs assessment and identifying those bright spot communities uh, using a health landscape, which is a data visualization tool. So this is one of uh, the things that we're using health landscape for. And you can see here on the left, uh, this is the opioid overdose deaths per 100,000 individuals. And on the right, this is a list or showing you the buprenorphine waiver practitioners per 100,000 individuals. So you can see here in areas where we have higher opioid overdose deaths, we tend to have less buprenorphine waiver practitioners. Um, so this helps us with focusing on where we need to increase access to treatment providers. We also, through the Support Act grant, we hold bi-monthly stakeholder meetings. Uh, we had a contract that made recommendations for leveraging managed care organizations to, to increase access to care. We created a hepatitis C treatment provider map to help in promoting screening and treatment access. And then we also are implementing new substance use disorder treatment and connections to care models, such as I mentioned, the emergency department bridge clinic, uh, increasing access through telehealth, increasing access to our peer recovery support services, and then enhancing collaboration with public safety and Medicaid to increase access to treatment for those involved in the carceral system. We're also leveraging data with our managed care organizations and our external quality review organization or our EQRO. Uh, the EQRO uh, for 2020 helped us development development of performance measures and specifications. And so these include uh, concurrent prescribing of naloxone and high dose opioids, uh, looking at naloxone use and high risk of overdose, treatment of hepatitis C for those with hepatitis C and substance use disorders. We're looking at treatment of uh, HIV for those with HIV and substance use disorders, looking at our preferred OBOT compliance, and then looking at several cascade of care models, um, one focusing on individuals with opiate use disorder and another individuals with hepatitis C and then the third individuals with HIV. And so part of the work with our EQO this next year will be actually implementing some of these uh, performance measures and specifications. And then lastly, want to highlight um, some Medicaid updates. Uh, effective January 1st, we removed the prior authorization and standardization of criteria for HIV medications. We also removed the prior authorization for HCV medications. And then on February 1st, we're creating a comprehensive and standardized coverage for individuals uh, who are transgender, uh, and they're at being able to access uh, care under the Medicaid benefit. And with this, I will pass it over to my colleague, Laura. Good morning, everyone. Thank you, Ashley, for handing the presentation over to me. Great job. Uh, my name is Laura Reed, and I am the Behavioral Health Senior Program Advisor um, at the Department of Medical Assistance Services, and Ashley and I work closely together, Ashley on the substance use disorder side and myself on, on the mental health side, and thank you for having me today to talk about some great initiatives that uh, Medicaid is doing across the state, and so I'm going to get into talking about um, a specific project uh, that's been going on since 2018-2019 uh, timeframe called Project Bravo, uh, as well as you may also know it as Behavioral Health Enhancement. Um, so I'm going to take it away. 
So uh, good morning, everyone. I'm here to talk about Project Bravo, which really stands for Behavioral Health Redesign for Access, Value, and Outcomes. And the enhancement of behavioral health services um, is a short-term and long-term vision um, and a proposal to advance behavioral health care uh, for our Commonwealth, <clears throat> excuse me, for our Commonwealth by improving access and quality of service uh, through our Medicaid program, um, as we are the largest payer of behavioral health services across uh, Virginia. And approximately one-third of the individuals that we serve um, have a behavioral health diagnosis. Um, our proposed enhancement seeks to progressively build a full continuum of evidence-based trauma-informed and prevention-oriented care that focuses on bolstering resiliency and the recovery of our members. We really needed to dig deep and recognize that our current behavioral health system is focused on reimbursement and provision um, of services that are high acuity and serve our members with the most intense needs. Our current service array uh, is outdated and involves only minimal integration of evidence-based practices. And we have limited uh, effectiveness data and challenges with quality and accessibility across services and geographic regions uh, in our state. The bottom line is that Virginia can do better and we have a plan and the plan is called Project Bravo. We have been working with our committed interagency partners, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, and hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders uh, to build a long-term vision for transformation and a short-term proposal to address our uh, most critical member and system needs at this time. The vision for enhancing behavioral health services in the Medicaid-funded system includes shifting from a uh, from working with a reactive, crisis-driven, high-cost system reliant on intensive services to one that is more proactive, more preventative, cost-efficient, and focused on providing services in the least restrictive environment, assuring effective and efficient use of resources for our Commonwealth's most vulnerable citizens by meeting people's needs in their environment where they already seek support, such as schools and physical health care settings investing in prevention and early intervention services that promote resiliency and buffer against the effects of adverse childhood experiences. And I'll go into just a little bit of detail about the acronym BRAVO. Uh, it is near dear to our heart and uh, certainly means uh, behavioral health redesign for access, value, and outcomes. It also um, has a, a personal meaning to, to our teams at uh, the Department of Medical System Services and the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Um, the uh, previous commissioner of the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services, Hughes Melton, um, died tragically in 2019, and he really was uh, the backbone of this project um, and really was the one that had the initial vision for this project and what it would look like across our state. Unfortunately, he died tragically in a car accident, and we wanted to uh, really remember him uh, throughout this project as we move forward with it. And he was a pilot, um, and his call sign was Bravo. And so uh, that is also a second reason why, why our project is called Project Bravo. So this next slide really talks about what our uh, previous uh, continuum of care looks like on, on the mental health side um, before we implemented the new services that we're going to talk about in just a little bit. And um, you can call these stair steps or buckets, um, but you can see that our continuum is, it starts on prevention and goes to inpatient. Um, and you can see that there are very few services in the majority of the stair steps or buckets. The majority of our services land in the fourth bucket, which is community mental health rehabilitation services. And many of those, um, as I said before, are, are high acuity. You have to meet a, a certain threshold of symptoms um, in order to receive those services. Often you have to be at risk of hospitalization or in crisis uh, to receive many of those services. And that's not uh, really the most beneficial way to, to build a system um, in terms of really thinking about prevention and making sure individuals are, are getting their needs met before uh, they have a crisis. And so these services um, are what we call homegrown services. These services have been around for several decades and DMAS really uh, grew those services 
um, many decades ago and, and really develop those internally. Um, they lack evidence-based um, and really are reliant on, you know, services for acute problems. And the service definitions and the policies and the rate structures around those services um, don't really support best practices um, in our mental health system. And so really that is part of our vision in terms of really enhancing some of these services uh, with better, uh, more clear policies and rates that really enhance uh, what we want to see, um, you know, being done, in, being done in our system. The next visual is what we like to call our North Star. And this is a visual of what we want our continuum of care uh, for behavioral health to, to really look like. We aren't there yet, but we're really excited to tell you that we have started that journey. And we're gonna talk a little bit about where we've started that journey. Uh, the stars really represent uh, where we started the journey and sort of the services that we're gonna talk about in a little bit. The, one, the new ones that we implemented, sort of where they lie in the continuum. We started um, in the middle of the continuum um, and there's specific uh, reason for that. We have um, a very large uh, psychiatric bed crisis in Virginia. Uh, the most of our state hospitals are to capacity or beyond. Um, and we have a really huge problem with not having um, really well-funded um, evidence-based programs in the community that the individuals who are ready for discharge can step down to. Um, so often individuals are stuck in the hospital um, even though they're ready for discharge because we don't have an appropriate service for them in the community uh, where they live that can help sustain them in their uh, in their environment. Um, and so we really focused uh, this round, what we call phase one of Project Bravo, um, services that would really address our state hospital uh, uh, census crisis and really help those individuals step down um, to evidence-based community services that would really help sustain them. Uh, you can see there are eight buckets instead of five um, and range from promotion and prevention all the way to inpatient. Um, and our, the services we've uh, implemented in phase one um, are in the middle. So we uh, implemented services in intensive community-based support bucket. We also implemented intensive clinic facility-based support, as well as our comprehensive crisis services, which we're going to get into much more detail in just a little bit. This next slide really tells you sort of where we are in implementation. So we took this in a very stepwise process. We did um, a massive sort of study uh, through the Farley Center um, around what our current behavioral health system looks like, what are the barriers, uh, what are the pros and cons of it. Uh, we engaged hundreds of stakeholders um, around uh, the state and even nationally um, to really look at what do we want our current behavioral health system to look like. Uh, we did not want to um, go uh, through this journey uh, in a vacuum or a bubble. Um, so we have engaged the individuals we serve, we engage many of our stakeholders at the state, locally, regionally, people who um, provide the service, uh, people who receive the service, and many advocates around the state um, to really provide us feedback about um, our policies and, and really what we should be doing. And then we decided uh, to design a continuum of care around that feedback. And so we, we have done both of those things. Um, and now we are really sort of in the middle of the triangle or pyramid around expanding workforce. We have a major workforce crisis uh, in Virginia and really nationally uh, in terms of behavioral health workforce. Uh, many of our licensed individuals uh, do not within Virginia do not provide service in the Medicaid service array, and there are various barriers to that. And so part of uh, building these services was uh, really enticing it and hoping that licensed professionals, uh, mental health professionals would, would come into our service array and start providing our services. Much of our services are provided uh, by individuals who are unlicensed um, and that makes uh, our system, um, that, that makes it hard for our system to be evidence-based uh, when our licensed individuals uh, would prefer to, to provide service elsewhere. 
Um, we do know there's a shortage of licensed individuals, so we are working uh, on the state level um, to really seek solutions to, you know, how can we build uh, a system of licensed professionals? Um, how can we make sure that they are getting the training that they need to provide Medicaid services um, and to understand our service array um, and to make sure that they're getting paid well to do that? Um, and so that is sort of where we are in sort of implementation at this point. And then the next step is really to look at, you know, outcome measures. Um, that's a hugely important part of what we're doing in terms of we don't have a lot of evidence right now that the services in our service array work on the mental health side. We have very little data around that. And so part of our process uh, is going to be setting up standardized outcome measures um, that every provider has to collect um, so that we have some way of understanding sort of what's going on at the ground level and um, our Medicaid members really getting the service that they need to meet their needs and meet their treatment needs. So we needed money uh, for this project, uh, let's face it, uh, that is the reality of um, our system. And so we went through a very lengthy process um, to get the money approved for this project, uh, which started back in, in 2018 with a proposal to the General Assembly and, uh, and a rate study that we had to do for each of the services that we're going to implement to set a rate so that we could estimate how much it would cost to provide those services. And so, uh, as actually explained in the beginning, uh, Medicaid, uh, part, you know, federal Medicaid provides a match, and then the state also has to match those funds um, at some level. And so, this is what the breakdown is of our um, our budget for Project Bravo Phase One. And so, general funds um, are state funds, and so we receive ten, uh, a little over ten million dollars from the General Assembly. And then non-general funds are federal funds, um, and so that's the, mat, the federal match. And so the total funding for this first phase of the project is a little over $24 million that we will get each year uh, to provide these new services. And so it is not a small chunk of change. Um, we uh, had initial approval uh, from the regular General Assembly session back in March of 2020. Um, unfortunately, those funds were unallotted because of COVID, um, and many other funds were unallotted at that time because we didn't, the state didn't know how much it was going to cost to respond to COVID. Um, and then we received, uh, the funds were reallotted and we received final approval from the General Assembly special session in November of 2020. Um, and so that was really exciting for us, uh, but also that we had a really tight timeline. Uh, we got approval in November of 2020 and three of our services um, out of the nine needed to go live in July of, of 2021. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, what we did in the timeline for how we made that work. So over the last six months, uh, DMAS has worked in partnership with DBHDS to launch all services authorized through the funding of Project Bravo. Uh, this project is also known broadly as Behavioral Health Enhancement. In the short term, the services implemented in 2021 seek to alleviate the psychiatric bed crisis by providing diversion and discharge options that have demonstrated effectiveness towards this purpose. In the long term, Bravo seeks to develop a robust continuum of behavioral health care services that are high quality, evidence-based, and trauma-informed and cost-effective use of Medicaid funds. The investment in high quality behavioral health care are critical to address whole person health, reduce the cost of unnecessary emergency room visits and facility based care, and address the impacts of COVID-19. The preliminary implementation of these services affords Virginia the opportunity to engage the centers of Medicare and Medicaid around the application of the 11-15 uh, uh, SMI waiver, SMI standing for seriously mentally ill. Uh, which would allow us to draw down a federal match to cover residential treatment for adults with serious mental illness. We currently only cover residential treatment for youth or substance use disorders, and this level of care for adults could support additional reduced reliance on hospitalization. We have worked closely with our other agencies involved in behavioral health care to ensure that we are working to maximize savings to the general fund by integration of services otherwise paid directly from general fund. For example, 60% of youth involved in juvenile justice are estimated to be Medicare members. 
while well, they used to be dependent on general funds to cover high quality treatments for disruptive behavior through the Department of Juvenile Justice, they can now receive those same services through Medicaid funding and we can pull down the federal match. UMass has also been at the table in development of an academic partnership with uh, Virginia Commonwealth University and the governance structure uh, with over behavioral health serving agencies that has resulted in the first Virginia Center for Evidence-Based Partnership, which will support evaluation and the transparent reporting of cross-agency implementation of these services. The complex process of integrating new Medicare crisis services into a multi-payer system to assure that all Virginians can access the new 998 Behavioral Health uh, 911, which we'll talk about a little bit, has been challenging, but will transform the way that Virginia, Virginians enter behavioral health care. While the ER uh, used to be the primary means by which most Virginians access behavioral health services, they will, not, they will now have a service array of crisis services to meet their needs in the community. Reducing costs, but also needless separation from their natural supports and communities. Growing the infrastructure of the system and the network of providers will take time, but is our best investment towards reduction of psychiatric of our psychiatric bed crisis. So you can see uh, a list of the services that we implemented. I'm going into a little bit detail in the next slide. But in July of this past year, we implemented a service called Assertive Community Treatment. And we also implemented two other services called mental health partial hospitalization and mental health intensive outpatient. These two services <clears throat> we have on our art side, um, on our substance use disorder side, but did not have on our mental health side. So those are new services. <clears throat> uh, in December of this year, we implemented multi-systemic therapy and functional family therapy. Uh, these are two youth-based services that we'll get into a little bit in detail next. And our four crisis services, mobile crisis response, community stabilization, 23-hour crisis stabilization, and residential crisis stabilization units. So let's talk about uh, the services that we implemented. So Program of Assertive Community Treatment, or PACT, or as they like to say, ACT, um, is a high-intensity team-based treatment delivered in the community for individuals with serious mental illness. Uh, it is really referred to as, quote, hospitals without walls. Uh, it has a proven track record of success in Virginia already. A cohort of over 300 individuals served by the PACT teams in the past two years decreased their state hospital bed days by 54%. Um, as compared to the two years prior to their enrollment uh, in the PAC team. This service uh, is driven by a uh, multidisciplinary team of individuals that work uh, with the individual participating in the service to keep them in the community. Um, it is what we like to call a wraparound service um, and is uh, really driven by um, medication management, therapy, um, increased um, services um, in terms of support for employment, housing, um, education, and their medication. Partial hospitalization program and the intensive outpatient program, these are two standard services uh, missing from the mental health benefit in Medicaid that promote diversion and step down from inpatient settings. Uh, these are structured clinic-based uh, programs that are for children, adolescents, and adults, um, yet still allow the individual to remain in their home, attend school, or work. And national data suggests that approximately uh, one out of five individuals could be served um, by one of these programs instead of inpatient. Multi-systemic therapy and functional family therapy are uh, community-based services, home-based services for adolescents. Um, generally speaking, that are involved with the juvenile justice system and really um, a cost-effective alternative to inpatient and residential placements. Um, there's already been success and we already have um, these services in our system. They were paid through by the Department of Juvenile Justice since 2016. Uh, but did not have a Medicaid rate uh, to sustain those services. And so we're really proud of the work that we've done with the Department of Juvenile Justice bringing a Medicaid rate on for these two really wonderful 
um, evidence-based services um, that are going to be a great addition to our, our Medicaid payroll health services array. And then uh, the last bucket of services that we brought on were four services called our Comprehensive Crisis Services. It's a full set of evidence-based crisis services uh, that would involve regional call centers to dispatch public and private providers to conduct mobile crisis intervention, um, ongoing community-based crisis stabilization. That is a bridge service, sort of, I'm going to hold your hand um, until we can sort of set you up with longer-term services. Um, and what also also brought on a, a reimbursement rate for uh, residential crisis services and what we call 23 hour uh, crisis stabilization. It is based on a national model called Crisis Now, and you can see uh, the website there if you want to go learn about uh, more, learn more about that model. So we're going to talk a little bit um, about crisis, uh, the four crisis services is the most complex set of services that uh, we have implemented um, this year um, and really um, a, a major partnership with the, the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services. Um, so our crisis services have been problematic uh, in Medicaid in terms of we did not have a great array of services. We had two services. They really had problematic rates and unit structures. Um, challenging, uh, there's been a challenge in terms of collaboration between our community services board, our public behavioral health system, and our private providers around uh, provision of crises, uh, crisis services, um, and who does what. Um, and so we're really excited um, that uh, last, uh, last year, um, federal legislation passed. Um, and we are the first state, uh, we're really excited to say that we're the first state to implement uh, the 988 call center, um, and that will go live uh, in July of this year, so July of uh, 2022. Um, and that call center is really uh, 911 for behavioral health crises. It is available to, to all uh, individuals in our state, um, and that number is 988. Uh, it goes directly to the National Suicide Hotline, and then uh, that hotline uh, connects that individual uh, with, uh, you can sort of see the, uh, the tier below, which is state, um, our state regional hubs, um, and there are five of them, and they uh, right now are uh, run out of uh, five separate CSEs across the state, and they run those call centers, so what happens is Somebody answers the phone, uh, we triage the situation, what's going on, how can we help you? Um, and almost 80% of the calls that come into that call center nationally, the national data um, are managed over the phone, uh, which is really surprising to me actually. Um, and then uh, the 20% uh, need some sort of response outside of out of the phone call triage. And so the next service we're going to talk about is mobile crisis. And so a mobile crisis response team is dispatched to that individual um, in the community where they are, wherever it may be. Um, and that service is a short-term service, generally speaking, four to eight hours of support uh, and really helping to um, de-escalate the situation and get that individual linked uh, with services that are going to support them, you know, ongoing. And then we have uh, the intersection between our, our local uh, community services boards who have launched their Marcus Alert protocols and here in Virginia. Um, unfortunately, there um, had to be, you know, a, a major uh, tragic situation with, a, with an individual, uh, Marcus Peters, who was shot and killed by a police officer um, on the side of uh, 95 um, interstate while he was having a mental health emergency. And uh, this, um, these comprehensive crisis services really, uh, we were already in the process of implementing them, uh, but, but the, leg the state legislation around the Marcus Peters Act really pushed us that this is we're going in the right direction this is what we need in our community to make sure um, that our citizens are taken care of and not put in danger uh, when they're having a mental health crisis 
So a little bit about the four services. Uh, mobile crisis response is someone to call, a person to go to you to help you de de-escalate and manage what's going on. Uh, those are dispatched through the regional hubs and generally speaking, two-person teams. And there's community stabilization. That is really someone to hold my hand. That's a bridge service. If I don't have, if I'm not already connected to a longer term service that's going to meet my needs, then this service is going to stay with you, you know, two to three weeks to really help you get connected to that service. And then the next tier above is 23 hour crisis stabilization. That's a clinic based. Um, service for 23 hours. Um, it allows for a longer period of time of assessment. Maybe we were able to de-escalate the way you wanted to with the mobile crisis team, or maybe we need more time to assess what your needs are. Um, and so this is somewhere to go. It's a clinic-based um, type service where someone can go and be assessed for 23 hours and then linked to an appropriate service. And then the next tier up is residential crisis stabilization. And that is also somewhere to go in a longer term, generally speaking, three to five days um, of community-based residential crisis stabilization. This is another slide of just sort of how it works. Uh, so somebody calls into the mobile crisis hotline and then a mobile team is dispatched. Um, and then the mobile team really sort of determines, okay, what level of care does this individual need? Again, many of those are triaged over the phone and don't even need a whole dispatch. Um, so Again, our, our crisis services really seek to alleviate our psychiatric bed crisis. 80% of calls are resolved over the phone. 70% um, uh, of that 20% um, are resolved with mobile crisis response. And then a small portion either need hospitalization or, or further increased care. We've learned a lot of things on our implementation of these services, especially during a pandemic. Uh, we've had a lot of success. Uh, we did it together with hundreds of stakeholders during the pandemic. Uh, we never thought we would be doing that. Uh, we have seen um, increased enrollment of our sort of community treatment teams, mental health out, uh, intensive outpatient and mental health partial hospitalization. Uh, we're really excited to see that providers want to provide those services. Um, and we really need them to provide those services so we can make this work for our citizens. We've had lessons learned. Um, it has been hard to do this. Um, over in during a pandemic. Um, we have had to have a lot of consultation with individual providers uh, to help them uh, really navigate the Medicaid system, which can be really complex. Um, and really just not giving up. Uh, we never gave up and, and we got it done. Um, we would like to do a next phase of Project Bravo. Uh, this is, of course, phase one, and we would like to do a next phase. We do not have authority from the General Assembly to do a phase two, uh, but we are hoping that we will get that uh, this year. We'll cross our fingers. Um, and really what we're going to be focusing on, hopefully in phase two, if we get authority, is specific to, to child and youth services, um, so school-based services, um, expanding reimbursement for evidence-based practices for services that provide uh, treatment specific to youth, um, services that are wraparound services that are high fidelity. Um, and we really have you know, come to understand we really do have a behavioral health crisis for our youth um, specific to the pandemic. And so this is the time to really focus on that. Um, our other focus is really going to be on integrated care, so really integrating services into primary care, healthcare settings. Um, that's something that we have a real passion for. Um, that's where individuals go to get their medical care, um, and so it's uh, going to be a really exciting to see how how phase two um, gets up and running, uh, with the hope that we'll get approval from the general assembly. This is our contact information uh, at Medicaid. If you have any questions about our presentation, uh, behavioral health, myself, and uh, the team on the mental health side can be reached at enhancedph at dmass.virginia.gov. Our arts team on the substance use disorder side can be reached at sud at dmass.virginia.gov. And our support at grant can be reached at support grant at dmass.virginia.gov. And that is the end of our presentation. And I believe we are going to open up to questions. Thanks so much for listening.
<clears throat> All right, thank you so much, Ashley and Laura, for your great presentation. Um, we do have a couple of questions that have come in. So the first question is, where can I find escalation, escalation steps or a grievance policy for either DMAS or local agencies? I have a client in pending status for Medicaid since November, and it's already been escalated to the case manager, supervisor, supervisor's manager, and DMAS. Hi, Ashley. Thank you. I can take this one. So for the Medicaid processing time uh, per policy is for complete applications, they have to be processed within a 45 day time frame. Um, there might be situations that if the eligibility worker is needing ad additional information to be able to process the Medicaid application, um, that might play into effect. Um, but a, a couple things. Um, there is uh, members have the right to appeal and um, that could be an appeal of a denied Medicaid application or I understand there's appeal process for um, delayed processing. So I'm going to put that information if I put it in the chat, Ashley, will that get to all folks or can I put it in the chat to you. I think if you put it in our Zoom chat, I think Brad can post it as a reply. Brad, right. you can correct me in our chat. Okay, we'll, we'll get that information to them uh, later. We'll send it out later. Okay. Um, and then there's also, we have a, a great team that work in our um, eligibility division, and they are also able, like whenever I get contacted, if somebody's trying to check on a status and it's beyond the time frame, and they're not able to get a response from uh, the local department of social services, we work very closely with our eligibility division. Um, so for that particular person who has a individual they're working with, um, with this Medicaid application, um, you can also send a question to our eligibility division to check on the status of the application. And that is at Virginia, um, abbreviated VA Medicaid questions at dmas.virginiaspelledout.gov. Again, it's VA Medicaid questions at dmas.virginiaspelledout.gov. Great, thank you. And for all our participants, we will make sure to send that information out. Um, so really quickly before we go to the next question, just a reminder for participants that if you have if you have questions that you haven't put, um, you can use the Q&A button to ask any questions that you may have. Um, and so the next question is, can you talk about the needs that were identified um, through the needs assessment that you conducted? I'm, I'm going to take that one because I'm going to assume that they're talking about Project Bravo needs assessment. Um, yes. And so, uh, one, you can, you can find that on our website and I will, I'll put the link in the chat and um, that can get sent out so you guys can, can have the full, uh, I believe, 70 pages of the needs assessment. Um, but in, in general, um, you know, there are a lot of gaps. Uh, in our behavioral health system, and it looked uh, really specifically, um, you know, the major gap we have is prevention services, uh, services that are, you know, upstream uh, from the current services that we have. Um, and I talked a little bit about that in the presentation in terms of the majority of our services are in that fourth bucket, and you have to have, you know, relatively high acuity symptoms to be able to um, meet the medical necessity criteria for those services. So I think the, the largest gap we have um, is prevention services. And, and that, you know, that's a, a vague term um, and can mean a lot of different things. I think for us, um, what we are looking towards in terms of phase two services, um, we are really looking to expand um, our school-based services and enhance our school-based services. Uh, we are looking um, 
a lot of into integrated behavioral health care services into primary care settings um, so that, again, you know, where people get their primary care visits, their well child visits, their well adult visits um, that, you know, they receive, um, you know, they can receive behavioral health services in that primary care setting, um, you know, before, um, you know, a, a mental health issue becomes, you know, a major problem. Um, and so the, those are some of the, the specific things that we're looking at. Um, and certainly uh, we're looking at, you know, appropriate um, space services um, for our intensive community-based sort of bucket. Um, and really, you know, also looking at narrow target populations for the higher intensity services like residential or inpatient. So, you know, those, the individuals that need that level of service, like what, what are their needs and, you know, how can we really tailor our residential settings um, to, to what those needs are? Um, what I will say uh, is general in terms of residential across our state. Um, on the mental health side, we do not cover adult residential. Uh, we only cover uh, youth residential. And um, part of the reason is that we need a waiver um, from the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid in order to, uh, it's called an 1115 waiver, in order to cover adult residential services. and. One of the things we have to be able to uh, demonstrate to CMS is that we have um, a full continuum of community-based services um, that are evidence-based um, before we can apply for that waiver, um, of course, because they want to be able to say, okay, these are the services that those individuals are gonna step down into and in the community. Um, so that's another reason, uh, sort of another gap uh, that we're that we're looking at, and another reason uh, why we're moving forward with Project Bravo. Great. Um, and then this next question, I believe it was in the first part of your presentation. You mentioned that you would be expanding um, services being provided for comprehensive transgender care. Can you talk about bit about more specifically what types of services um, those would, would be? Yeah. Hi, Ashley. So um, just to let folks know, I've uh, pasted a copy of the link to the gender dysphoria coverage memorandum um, that we can share, uh, but it was posted on December 10th. So if you know how to navigate to the Virginia Medicaid web provider portal, and look under memorandums, it's under 2021. And again, it's dated December 10th. Um, but so I, I'm not an expert, but just to share kind of an overview of um, the, the coverage of gender dysphoria services, um, it is basically expanding um, a wide variety of treatment. Um, and it's also detailed in chapter four of the physician practitioner manual, um, as well as appendix D of the DMAS hospital manual. Um, but it includes uh, services, uh, dates of service for um, these beginning on February 1st of 2022, and includes gender dysphoria, surgical services, facial feminization or masculinization services, um, with uh, dates of service on or after February 1st of 2022, um, and those do require um, service authorization. And so the physician manual and the um, appendix D of the hospital manual has uh, specifics of how to request service authorization. Um, additional services uh, include um, we, following the professional guidelines uh, and policies as set forth in the most recent World Professional Association for Transgender Health Clinical Guidelines, um, as well as Endocrine Society Treatment of Gender Dysphoric or Gender Intercongruent Persons Clinical Practice Guidelines, and the American Academy of Pediatrics. Um, further, uh, kind of working backwards, um, the treatment coverage includes medical therapy, including pharmacological therapy for puberty suppression, as well as subsequent gender affirming pharmacological treatment. 
Um, surgical treatment traditionally includes chest as well as genital surgeries, aligning primary and secondary sex characteristics with the individual's gender identity. Additional services include those uh, for behavioral health, speech and other therapies, and other procedures, including those for facial and voice modification. So a, a full spectrum of coverage, and I and invite folks to, to um, look at the provider manuals that'll have that in more detail. Great, thank you. Um, and for our participants, if you go to the answered question sections, um, you will see all the links that have been shared by our presenters today. Um, and then the last question, can you talk more about how you plan to incorporate HIV care into, um, into treatment options for people with HIV and with opiate use disorder? Uh, so I can sp uh, speak to, uh, we have a new um, model of service when we implemented the arts benefit in 2017 called the office-based opioid treatment model, or we call it our preferred OBOT in Virginia Medicaid. And that is where um, individuals can go to like a primary care setting um, and see a, um, a buprenorphine waivered practitioner. So that's someone that has the waiver to be able to prescribe buprenorphine containing products for the treatment of opiate use disorder, um, as well as we require in the OBOT model, a co-located licensed behavioral health clinician. Um, the OBOT model is a higher standard for uh, medication assisted treatment. So they get higher rates. Um, so the, we also require some higher um, capacity to meet services uh, related to opiate use disorder. And so one of those is uh, ensuring that um, within the OBOT model that they're screening and uh, either providing or referring for treatment, um, not only for HIV, but also for um, hepatitis um, A, B, and C. So for a provider to be approved to have that OBOT recognition, they have to indicate whether they are um, providing or referring for the screening for HIV, hepatitis B and C, as well as tuberculosis treatment. Um, just that has to be done at, at initiation for opiate use disorder, as well as we require these annually. Okay, great. Um, I'm trying to see if there's any more questions. Um, Participants, if you have questions that you've thought of, please use the Q&A box to enter them. I'll give it another minute or so to see if anyone enters in a new question. Um, and, and Ashley, I am also going to paste another link. We have a lot of training resources through our Support Act. Mm -hmm. um, we have a lot of, um, like we call them 101 webinars, um, and those, we actually have 34, um, ranging a variety of substance use disorder um, related topics. Um, I'm looking like at ses session 19, a substance use disorder in LGBTQ clients. Um, we also cover like best practices with HIV and HCV. Um, those are already um, trainings that have already occurred and those slide decks are available. But then we also have a series currently of um, live webinar trainings um, that's through the winter. And there's a link that folks can um, look at the various topics. And these are open to anyone um, and they're free. So I encourage you to, to share with your colleagues. Great. Hey, um... And then lastly, is there anything um, that you all would like to add just in general? Um, anything you wanna expand on or? You know, I think, and, and Laura, you chime in. I think the goal um, for Medicaid is transparency and member focus and kind of that's the, the, the mission for behavioral health is that we want to continue to improve our, our services and um, the outcomes of individuals. And so, 
We are, um, Laura and I and our director, uh, Dr. Alyssa Ward, um, and our deputy director, Tammy Whitlock, and our director, Karen Kimsey, are very focused on, um, on, on members. I mean, the, the whole purpose of the Medicaid benefit is to improve health outcomes, um, and beha including behavioral health outcomes for members. And so uh, again, the, the, the emails that Laura had covered during the, the recording, um, that's direct access to our behavioral health division. And we have staff that monitor those uh, daily. Um, so encourage reaching out if you have questions, concerns, um, and if we're not the, the, the persons to answer, uh, we are very diligent to find the, the right contact within the organization. Laura, do you, any other thoughts? I think the, um, I think that was a nice ending, but what I, what I will say is, um, you know, piggyback on your um, stance around transparency. That's one of the things that we have really worked um, hard on over the past year in terms of really uh, providing um, a clear a clearer picture of our services and who's utilizing our services, um, how much they're being utilized um, on the mental health side. We just uh, launched a, um, a dashboard on our website um, that gives some really great data around each of our mental, our community mental health services, um, and then the demographics of the individuals that receive those services. Um, and then also sort of utilization in terms of how much money we're spending on those services uh, in total and then per member. Um, so it's, it's a brand new dashboard that's been up for maybe a month or so. Um, and we're, uh, it probably needs some tweaks as we go, um, but we're really excited to be able to provide that data in, the, in a public forum. Um, there's a lot of talk around, you know, and assumptions around, you know, the individuals that receive our services and how much money we're spending. Um, and, you know, it's nice to be able to say, here's the actual, you know, data um, and be able to, to point to that for, for our stakeholders. So. Um, I encourage you guys to, to look at that and, and certainly you can, if you have questions about it, you can send it to our divisional email box. Um, I've, I've spent uh, with our Office of Data Analytics about a year making that dashboard, so hopefully I can potentially answer any questions you guys have. Great. Thank you, um, Ashley and Laura, for this great presentation, as well as for the resources that you all have provided. At this time, we will take our lunch break. So during the break, please check out the agency page and the resources that have been uploaded onto the CVENT event page. Um, and this, the breakout sessions will start at 12, 12 o'clock. Thank you all and enjoy your break. Thank you.